All right, folks, there's been a lot of talk about these mainstream polls showing Donald Trump getting in excess of 20 percent of the black vote in the election where the folks at Black Pack partnered with uh, Cornell Belcher's firm, uh, Brilliant Corners Research and Strategies to survey black voters. And the results are a lot different than what is being reported in these other polls. Adrian Shropshire is the executive director of Black Pack, joins me now from LA. Adrian, glad to have you on the show. So what is your poll, uh, what does your poll say uh, that makes it so different than all the rest of this stuff we've been hearing for the past several months? So we have actually been polling and doing focus groups for the last six months. Um, and part of that is because obviously before we head into any election cycle, we want to make sure that we are really clear on where black voters are, um, their opinions, their attitudes, how they're feeling about what is going on in the country. So we've been doing this for the last six months. So it should come as no surprise then that we um, are a little unnerved by this narrative that's emerging uh, because of recent polling that suggests, as you said, that upwards of 20 percent of black voters will um, will give their votes uh, to, to Donald Trump and, and the Republicans. Republican Party, because no, that is not what we have seen. And in some ways, I think, you know, we certainly could look at the sample sizes in these polls. They're not robust. Um, and certainly not like the we're, we're not, you know, sampling or oversampling black voters. We're just polling black voters, um, period. And so our sample sizes are much, much more robust. Um, you know, when you have a small sample size, the, the potential to get outliers in there and then extrapolate what black voters think based on these outliers opinions, all of that is playing into this. But what I can tell you is that our polling for the last uh, six months and our focus groups um, don't suggest at all um, that there is some historic a uh, number of black folks that are saying that they're going to vote for Donald Trump. There is no racial realignment that appears to be happening um, in the research that that we're doing. And in fact, um, you know, the support levels for Donald Trump uh, have not risen uh, since 2020 uh, in the research that we've done. So he has all you know gotten between eight and 12 percent um, of black voters saying that they're going to support him going back to 2020. And I think the same is true for the thermometer that we use. You know, we use a thermometer. We ask people how warm or cold they feel um, toward a candidate. Um, and Donald Trump's thermometer has hovered just above zero. Um, you know, the coldest of cold um, in our research going all the way back to 2016. So it is um, unsettling to hear, and, and, and not so much the polls themselves, but there is a narrative emerging that suggests that black people are going to do something that the actual voter turnout data doesn't say. So we can look at the polls and what people are saying, but we actually need to look at what happens and what has happened on election day when black people have been asked to turn out and support support either Donald Trump or the Republican Party, because those numbers are strikingly and not surprisingly much lower than what any poll, what in any mainstream media poll has, has said. So, uh, and again, we look at these other polls. Uh, we are a fraction of those polled. Well, that, that's a lot different. Your poll, we are the entire poll. So you're right. getting a much better and robust understanding of black people and their thoughts and perspectives in your poll because it's just black people. It is not. Yeah, that's right. It's just it's just black folks. And so you, you're going to get a range of opinions. And I think, that you know, we always say because we know this, that black folks are not a monolith. And that is true. But there are some things that, that, that black people have agreed on. <laughs> there are some things that are uh, that are very clear to us in terms of what is at stake. And this is the other thing that, I you know, that, that just rings true for us um, in obviously is, you know, um, it, the opposite of what the mainstream polling is saying. We've been asking this question for the last six months. Um, what is the biggest threat to the black community? We ask it in our polls and we ask it in our focus groups. And the number one answer is the re-election of Donald Trump, followed closely at number two by white supremacy. Those two things are not unrelated in the minds of black folks. So black people are very clear about the threat that Donald Trump poses to this country. They're very clear about the threat that he poses to American democracy, but they're also really clear about the threat that he poses specifically to our community. And so it is hard for me to believe that people who believe that Donald Trump is the single greatest threat to the black community are also somehow then gonna give him 20% of our vote 
above and beyond what we have done for him or Republicans over the last several election cycles. Um, this right here, go to my iPad, uh, the slides that you guys, that y'all presented, uh, and, and you're showing actual results. 2016 exit polls uh, show 8%, Pew said 6. Uh, in 2020, uh, exit polls show 12, Pew said 8. Um, and then in 2022, uh, exit polls show nine, uh, and it was six. But one of the things that uh, a polls of Terrence Woodbury uh, uh, show uh, is that it, d it does, it's, now this is, and this is what I try to explain to people, this is national overall. But depending upon the state, right. that's different. So he said that Trump did better among African Americans, especially black men in North Carolina, and the spillover that affected Tom Tillis. Uh, and so I'm always trying to explain to people when you see these polls being discussed on television, they sort of mean nothing because a presidential election are state elections. It's really what's happening in Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, as opposed to you know, across the country, because the reality is the election is going to come down to about seven or eight states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, you know, so our polling is both national polling and battleground polling. So it is trying to get a specific lens on there the individual go. states um, where we know that one, that we know those states are going to determine the outcome of the election. But we also know that black voters will be determinant in some ways um, in many of those states. I mean, what I what I will say is the numbers that you showed, the sort of exit polls versus Pew, the Pew numbers are the actual after the fact. Uh, data, mm -hmm. right? So it is going back and, and looking through who actually uh, showed up, right? Uh, and not just the exit polls, which are always slightly higher than the actual turnout, uh, the actual turnout numbers and, and, and support numbers. So when we look at the Pew numbers, those are those are the ones that we use to say that this is what happened on election day, not the exit, because the exits are always a little bit off. Um, the thing that I will say, though, is that even when we look at the individual states, we aren't seeing, you know, again, like what the what the national polls are suggesting right now is actual racial realignment within the parties. There is nothing to indicate, <laughs> not right now, or again, over the past several election cycles, that, 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 that suggests that black people are gonna somehow in you know record numbers right. shift from one party to another now that doesn't mean the democrats don't have challenges right in this in this upcoming election cycle but the challenge is not is not based on our research for the last several months and over the last few years does not suggest that their their biggest problem is actually Donald Trump and the Republican party well one of the things that your survey showed is that uh, the concern that that Biden should have is uh, Biden Harris should have is from third party but that's also contingent if they actually qualify for the ballot in that that's particular right. state. Uh, earlier, we talked about, we were discussing why the Biden, Biden administration and, and the campaign, they're not focusing on the great work of the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division uh, and why they're not touting those things. Uh, and so we talked about narrative, messaging, misinformation. Uh, go back to my iPad. Y'all show here uh, how people are getting information, let's say by social media. Uh, and it says users of TikTok, Twitter, X, and Instagram were more likely to report hearing negative news about Biden. Now, granted, social media is not representative of the entire country, but it is the echo chamber, if you will. And so really what, what your poll is saying uh, to Biden-Harris campaign, y'all better step the hell your game up on these social applications where you are in the mix touting what you are doing. Otherwise, you're allowing others to define who you are and what you've done. That's exactly right. And so what we're seeing in those numbers is that exactly what you said, that is where people are getting the, the most negative information um, about, about the Biden-Harris administration. And so, yes, like I always say, like they need to be flooding the zone, like the volume of content that is, that is uh, coming out really just needs to be increased, um, in part because people really do want, they want to know the information. Um, when we're in focus groups and we say to people, you know, are you aware of what the, the administration has done, most people will say no. You present them with a list of all of the accomplished and across, as you say, not just in one area, right, but in a lot of areas. When you present that to people, people are pretty surprised. They're pretty surprised to learn it. They go, this sort of emotional reaction goes from, you know, being angry 
that they don't know. And part of that anger is because people don't want to be out here saying things that aren't true. And they feel like the campaign and, and you know, those of us who run independent organizations have an obligation to actually get them the truth. Um, and that is absolutely, um, you know, on, on the campaign and all of the surrogates that are a part of the campaign. But that information needs to increase uh, because people appreciate it and it changes their perspective. Right now, mm -hmm. they sort of are getting information from one place. They're getting Fox News talking points, right? The number of folks that sit in our, fo our focus groups and actually repeat back Fox News talking points, even though they don't watch Fox News, it's because those talking points and that messaging is showing up in their social media feeds. And while social media might not be fully representative, it is the place where the majority of people are saying that they're getting their news and information right now. Yep. So if you're looking for news and information, the majority of folks, at least in our polling, are going to social media first. Um, last question before I go to my panel, uh, and, and that is this here. Uh, I, New York Times, Siena, Quinnipiac, uh, Quinnipiac, all these other polls, I see constant conversation on MSNBC and CNN and Fox News, ABC, NBC, CBS, all these mainstream folks. Have they booked y'all to discuss your poll? Uh, no, I'm here with you. None of them? I mean, y'all yeah. y'all sent the release out, what, two days ago. Um, yeah. I mean, we got the release March 5th, uh, talking about uh, this. And, and all of these places have been talking black men, black men, black men, black people. So none of these people have booked y'all? No. And again, I, I go back to the concern around the narrative that is emerging, right? And there is something deep. No, no, that's my whole point. They, they, yeah. they, they're having discussions about these other polls and black people, especially black men. And here y'all actually poll black people Cornell Belcher is a paid contributor for MSNBC. You would think Morning Joe and the rest of these people would be talking about the poll that y'all commissioned. Yeah, I mean, we want the truth to get out to the American people, right? We don't want to send, we do not want, we should not want, I guess I should say, for false narratives to be out there or for data not to be discussed um, responsibly, quite frankly. Um, and there is, again, like, it's insulting. I mean, it, the narrative would suggest that black folks are out here just casting ballots willy-nilly. We're not doing that, right? It would suggest that we somehow should just ignore our gut feelings about people who actually want uh, to take away all of our rights, right? It would suggest that we're going to vote for people, um, you know, who who want to undermine again not just American democracy but our communities in general, and that we simply should just trust their polls, right? Not trust the things that we know, right? Not to, for, you know, to trust what we know about recent history, what we know about our past, um, that we should not think about all that. We should just trust these polls, and that's just it is it's irresponsible, um, and some might say it's malpractice. Questions from my panel. Rebecca, you're first. Hey, Adrian, it's good to see you. I'm going to explain the context of my question, that then I'm going to ask the question. So in 2016, uh, most of the polls showed that Hillary Clinton was up. It wasn't until September when Cornell Belcher like <coughs> rang the alarm and suggested, hey, <coughs> excuse me, Hillary is in trouble. <coughs> One thing that... Um, most of the pollsters didn't take into account is that Trump was able to draw white voters who normally don't show up in elections. So I've really been listening hard to Trump's rhetoric, especially over the last few months um, for this go round. And it sounds like the rhetoric he's using is to try to draw out black people who normally don't vote, but to draw them out and get them to convert and become Trump voters. Do you think that's possibly what Trump is trying to do, especially when he keeps touting black support? Um, because it one thing that I noticed by looking um, through um, this polling memo, it talks about likely African-American voters, it talks about registered um, African-American voters. Is there a chance that there are some black folks who are not registered yet who are who will be new to voting this year? Um, is there a chance that Trump will be able to get those types of folks out in a significant number that could actually impact and increase um, his black support? I actually don't think that the strategy is about winning over black voters at all. And I don't think that it ever is with the Republican Party. I think that it is about depressing the vote. I think it is about convincing black people that they shouldn't trust Democrats and therefore it's not worth their time to come out. And it's about saying to some black voters who may be on the fence 
um, that you should give us a look. Um, but largely it's about asking, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, keeping people home, right? Getting people to stay home. Or I think the other thing that we're seeing right now, obviously, is suggesting to people that there's an off ramp to a third party candidate. And as Roland said, you can suggest that if you want to, but people, you know, we need to do a better job of sort of educating people on what it means to get to 270 um, electoral college votes. Because if you're not on the ballot in states, you're not getting electoral college votes. So we shouldn't be confusing people, telling or suggesting that if they vote third party, that somehow they're voting for someone who has, you know, any chance in heck um, to to actually win. So I think that the strategy is about depressing the vote. That's usually what it always is. You know, Trump has some fixation with black people. He has some obsession with black men in particular. So he does the little things with the tennis shoes, right? Um, he does the little things to, you know, try and make him seem, uh, you know, like he's in with a set of with a set of people. Um, but that stuff really is all about just trying to keep us home and trying to uh, raise concern um, about the Democratic Party. Scott? Hey, Adrian, Scott Bolden here. You know, if black people don't know what the Biden-Harris team has done, that's not their fault. That's Biden-Harris's fault, right? And so I'd be interested uh, if they continue to lack these communication uh, or presentations to black folks and, and telling us what we've done. Does your polling suggest whether that's going to dictate whether more black people come out to vote or not, or whether they're going to vote for another candidate, whether it's Donald Trump or a third party candidate? Yeah, so I would look to both our polling and our focus groups for the answer to that question. So when we ask folks how, what they've heard, um, oftentimes it's very little. Um, and, you know, in our focus groups in particular, people are very animated about it. Right? Mm -hmm. They're very clear that they, they have not heard anything. Um, and mm -hmm. once you once we present to them, though, once we say, well, here are the things right here, are the things that we have said as a community are important to us. And here are the things that the Biden-Harris administration have done. People, um, you know, one again, as I said earlier, they're surprised. Um, they're not happy about the fact that they don't know. Um, and they're confused, yeah. right, about why they don't yeah. know. So, and but yeah. once you present that to them and you allow people to talk about it, they sort of their perspective changes. They say, Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Joe Biden points for that, right? Or they say, Well, I graded him at the beginning of the focus group, I gave him a D, but I didn't know he did all this, so I'm gonna give him a B. Right. So people change their perspective. And it is important. Again, that's why it's the volume that matters. And we know that Democrats are historically not good at messaging. They're not good at tooting their own horn. They're not good at any of that. Um, and you know, in a focus group a couple weeks ago in Detroit, a man said, you know what, Joe Biden needs to start running in his mouth. And that's exactly what people want. They, you know, they said Joe mm -hmm. Biden needs to start bragging, like say all of the things, because we know what Trump said he did, whether he did it or not. We know what he said he did. And we remember it from four years ago or three years ago now. Um, and we and we know what he is saying, claiming that he did now because he talks about it. He puts his name on every single thing and that Joe Biden needs to start doing that. And, and one other point I'll make on this is that people, even when they do know about the accomplishments or even when they personally benefited from some of the policies that the Biden-Harris administration um, has, has moved, they often don't connect it to Joe Biden. So people will say, oh, yeah, I got my student loan forgiven, but I didn't know that that was Joe Biden mm -hmm. or I, you know, I, I paid my rent because of the American Rescue Plan, but I didn't know that was Joe Biden. Right. So there is this thing about putting your name on it. Say you did it. <laughs> Let people know that you did that. <laughs> right. People love dark Brandon. Right. So pull him out and let people yeah. know that you did the things. But it's also important that they start talking about not just what they did, but what they're going to do. Yep. Right. Because we're, re we're getting to a point where people are going to say, OK, I got all that. That's cool. But there's some stuff that you didn't get done. So what are you going to do about that? So they do need to start transitioning to what what they are going to do, not just what they did. Uh, Robert. Uh, you know, I think that's a very important point that you're making. And what I, I've noticed that one of the problems is that Donald Trump has mastered the art of speaking on a third or seventh grade level when he's talking about issues. Uh, an example I used to use, I like to use immigration. If you ask Democrats, what are you going to do on immigration? They say, well, we need a bilateral conversation with our friends within our hegemonic sphere of influence to create a pathway to citizenship as well as increase border security, as well as creating uh, something along the lines of something like that. Trump's answer will be wall. 
Uh, what can Democrats do to simplify their messaging down from a paragraph to something like wall that more people can understand and be able to rally around? Well, you just said it. Um, it is simplifying the message. It's also what we see when, you know, when we talk about the Democrats have been have done big things and they say what? And we say, uh, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, that doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. to anybody. Right. What is right. in the right. Inflation Reduction Act? Right. What it has it meant for black communities? We have to break those things down and we have to talk about specifically what it means for our communities. Um, so you you said it like we have to. It's not that hard to break stuff down and people don't actually care about everything. <laughs> right. Um, there are some things that are actually really important and really specific to our community. But we also have to start talking about the things that people feel right. Like some of the stuff that we hear in our focus groups, this is about emotion. Right. When when a woman in a focus group says the hardest thing for me to do right now is buy food for my daughter, that's a that is that is um, unsettling. Right. That is that that woman is feeling something very deeply. She's afraid. Right. And they have to begin to speak to that, too. And that's part of what Trump does as, as well. So when you talk about immigration, what he's doing is stirring up fear in people. Right. And I know Democrats don't want to do that in that way, nor should they need to be careful about using rhetoric that is more divisive um, than is about bringing people together. But people are feeling very um, unstable right now. People are scared. Right. That thing about what's the, the greatest threat to the black community. Number one, Donald Trump. People are scared. Right. They're terrified of another Trump election. So Democrats need to talk in ways that people can understand. They need to break down these big things for people so that they can see how it benefited them. And they need to talk more about what they're going to do on things that haven't been addressed yet. Uh, where can if people want to uh, look at the poll itself and all information? Where can they go to see it? They can go to blackpack.com. All right. Blackpack.com. B-L-A-C-K-P-A-C.com. Adrian, we appreciate it. Thank you so very much.